Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today has been a winner of the Raman Magsaysay Award, often described as the Asian Nobel Prize for Community Service, but it's not the pedestal of an award that defines her. It is the causes that she embodies and represents with passion and commitment and an enormous participation in the processes of development and the issues related to development in India. I'm delighted to welcome Aruna Roy. Uh, Aruna, you've been sort of most uh, sort of frequently been associated in, in, in the public eye, really, uh, with uh, you know with issues of right to information, with right to work, right to security, uh, and really, you know, representing and, and embodying by your own lifestyles uh, the, the the passions, the needs, the crises, the predicaments of the poor uh, to whom you help provide a voice. Uh, you now a member of the. Uh, you know, National Advisory Board. Um, in, in some ways, it sort of represents an, an, an in induction by the system, perhaps, uh, where you're working very closely with government. Uh, has that been a, a, a sort of a fe involved a, a feeling of, of, of compromise, of, of surrender in some ways? What was the philosophical shift that uh, moved you from essentially a, a, a discourse of, of dissent uh, to one of perhaps seeming co-option? If you look at the uh, nature of our work, uh, I now belong to a large group of Indians who call themselves political activists involved with people's politics. So we're involved with the issue of the dam, we may be involved with fisher folk, with very poor peasants and workers. So we are involved with politics. Somewhere representative politics, which is the electoral system, has taken us over to a degree to which people's voices now are totally marginalized. The last three years, there's been a f more loud debate on how people like us should address electoral politics. There's also a kind of large understanding that we should engage with electoral politics. Now, electoral politics per se is not the end. The end is to see justice and equality, which is assured to us under the Constitution, meted out to every citizen of the country. And today, of course, we are divided between subjects and citizens. Subjects are those who get no access, and citizens are people like me, who can always get access. So if those people who are now subjects are to turn into citizens, they'll have to have a say in governance. And governance is a very large umbrella under which you have political participation, you have bodies appointed by the government. So there has been a change in the thinking of the movements. If you look at the political parties on the other side, I think more and more there is a big hiatus between many of the political parties, I won't say all, between what they do and what people really think. And there are red herrings which are floated in front of us at the time of election. We all fall a prey to it and at the end we are exactly where we always were. You had formed yourselves in some ways uh, into an alliance uh, that would fight uh, elections. Um, but that is sort of somewhat different to being co-opted by an existing government or a, a, a coalition of, uh, of No, of, I'm of coming to that. <laughs> so I think governments, you see, and I think the mistake many of us made was to see governments as completely alien from ourselves. Now, to institutionalize and achieve any of the objectives that we want, we have to have a say in governance, whether through elections or whether through other systems. So if this common minimum program really encompasses many of the major demands made by the movements, whether it's the Employment Guarantee Act, whether it is an amended Right to Information Act, whether it is uh, justice to tribals and uh, you know, a due process of law before eviction of tribals, whether it is a right to health, whether it's right to education, all these are our demands. If we leave it completely and totally, to the bureaucracy, uh, I'm not sure how far it will be translated into action. So what we really have come into the National Advisory Council are as monitors, because we've been asked to monitor the common minimum program. So our main role is to see that the promises made by an elected government are realized. In other words, we are there to ensure accountability. Mm -hmm. And if they are there to ensure accountability, we are in fact not part of the system. 
<laughs> we are in fact there to oversee the system and therefore it fits in absolutely with our right to information agenda where we see say that we need states we need government but we need them to work strongly and efficiently but with total accountability and transparency between the work that i was doing and my being there in the nac is that process a you know a satisfying one so far well it's a mixed blessing as always things are in some ways it's been very good because we've been able to do two or three things that were our agenda. One is that we've been able to push through an Employment Guarantee Act, which is an extremely important thing for this country, with growing liberalization and um, unemployment on absolute rise in rural areas, and with uh, people with no work, which leads to violence, which leads to all sorts of things, being co-opted by any agenda that is destructive. I think it's imperative for the well-being of this country that there be an Employment Guarantee Act and very, very important for the poor that we've been able to get the draft act through the National Advisory Council and with a great deal of sympathy uh, and in keeping many of the demands that we wanted is the beginning. Let's see now what the government of India does to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the same with the Right to Information Act. We've been able to get amendments through based on the best practices system as well as looking at other Indian acts like the Maharashtra Act, the Karnataka Act, which have been very good acts, some parts of the Delhi Act, whereas the act that was passed by the previous government was very, very weak. Mm -hmm. And they, in many cases, it might have been better not to have had the act. Mm -hmm. So since the government made a promise that they would do it, we've ag again made them accountable to their promise. Mm -hmm. So I really think it's advocacy. Mm -hmm. It's not co-option, mm -hmm. at worst. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when you talk about the you know the guarantee to employment, uh, it, it, it's 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 something that seems antithetical uh, to the current discourse on, on 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 economic restructuring, economic liberalization, and in the process that uh, it involves. Can you sort of explain to us, basically and and simply, uh, how this this will operate and how this might function? I think there's little, uh, there's little argument or debate that it's important, it's needed, and it's significant. But how does it dovetail uh, with, a, with a free economy model? Many of us do not agree with that model, as you know. But uh, if that model, and if this country doesn't somewhere take account of the millions who are unemployed and doesn't see labor as capital, this country is making a huge mistake. This is not for just the poor man or woman who doesn't get work. Not for me, it's for the country. So that capital has to be used, and the capital has to be used in a manner in which the state also becomes accountable. So under the e Employment Guarantee Bill, which will become an act, there's a mandate that anybody who wants to work, do manual work, can apply to the local tehsil or panchayat office or panchayat samiti for work. And within 15 days, they might get the work. And if they don't get the work, they get a uh, non-employment, unemployment bo uh, stipend, which is paid, you can call it anything. You can call it a dole, you can call it, there are many names by which you call it. But the point is that then the onus of not giving that work devolves on the state. We are all bothered in this country about a bureaucracy that doesn't function, about corruption, about inefficiencies. So it makes it necessary that this government prepares a shelf of plans and is ready with those shelf of plans. Now the shelf of plans further now, because we have devolution of panchayats, we have the panchayats all empowered, will force the panchayat into sitting with its and in the gram sabhas which involves people of evolving suitable plans which will help in uh, watershed management, in rainwater harvesting, in all the essential things will make this country a better place. And in all this we have fantastic examples. We have in Kerala, they are the people's plan which was worked through the panchayats. We have we have extraordinarily good models that exist in this country. Mm -hmm. The only thing is that it will force the government mm -hmm. not to look at things piecemeal, mm -hmm. but look at it as a holistic solution mm -hmm. and somehow link need with efficiency mm -hmm. and need and hunger, mm -hmm. which is what it's going to satisfy mm -hmm. with performance. You're watching a conversation with Aruna Roy, social worker and activist. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to continuing conversation with Aruna Roy. Uh, Aruna, I sort of described you as a social worker, social activist. Uh, which is which of the two might you prefer? Do you see yourself in the, in, in the role of activist, worker? 
<laughs> Actually, I now <laughs> call myself a socio-political activist because I really think what I'm doing is politics. It's people's politics, but it's politics. A social worker in our country is one who does uh, uh, delivery of services, which I've long since ceased to do. I don't think it's unimportant, mind you. I think it's very important, but it's something I don't normally do. So I think, yes. So help us understand better this evolution from uh, social worker to uh, to activist to social political activist. Actually, I've always been very moved by uh, the inequalities in this country, and I really even today find it extremely difficult. Just give you an example. The other day, I was coming from Vardha. I'd mm. gone to Vardha Gandhi Ashram. Be coming back by an ordinary second class compartment in a train coming from Vardha to Delhi, and. I can't tell you the numbers of people who came to beg. They begged with dignity. They didn't just pass the bowl round. There were young girls, mm -hmm. one of 11 and 16, asking for money, singing, somebody selling something. I think so long as that kind of dramatic inequality exists in this country, I can't sleep. So let mm -hmm. me say mm -hmm. that my motivation has come from my own self. And in a sense, I think you don't do anything for anybody. You only do it for yourself. And I think it's an axiomatic truth. Mm -hmm. So when I first went into social service, I thought social development I went into. There's service, development, and activism. Gandhiji called it seva, nirman, sangarsh. All three are linked, but all three are important for society. So I went into nirman activity, that is development activity. And I found that every time there was an impasse, you gave services, you, you had confrontation, you made people realize something, but there was some invisible barrier that people couldn't cross. Mm -hmm. And the more I thought about it, the more I felt that it was the larger politics, not engaging in vote electoral politics, but understanding that equ demanding equality is demanding equality of power structures. Mm -hmm. And demanding equality of power structures, whether you are a woman, a Dalit, mm -hmm. a minority community person, mm -hmm. or a tribal is is politics because you're depriving someone of property you're depriving someone of access so it's got to be fought through the best political system we have today which is democracy mm -hmm. so we really have to understand to use this democracy better to occupy democratic institutions and work them in our favor if you look at a panchayat for instance the feudal lord of the village became the sarpanch so he became doubly powerful maybe before this he was just a feudal lord he was a thakur but now he was a Thakur plus the Sarpanch. Okay, he didn't become the Sarpanch, he became president of the cooperative society. Mm -hmm. So he used that structure. Mm -hmm. If he didn't use that structure, then there was a third, a fourth, a fifth alternative. Mm -hmm. So you had to get away these structures from them and that meant straightforward battle for power. Mm -hmm. And a straightforward battle for power is politics. Mm -hmm. So whether it is in terms of village panchayats or whether in terms of large development projects mm -hmm. or whether it's in terms of medium activities or it's lopsided priorities, mm -hmm. you come up against a kind of decision making and power wielding which is politics. Mm -hmm. And since for me, the constitution of this country and democracy are kind of uh, yardsticks by which mm -hmm. I measure mm -hmm. how well we do or won't, don't do, I felt that we should work within the system. Mm -hmm. but for using these tools and empowering ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that sort of um, <coughs> expresses and articulates itself and, and manifests concretely uh, in a cultural environment where we have seen, of, we have sort of seen, acknowledged, applauded uh, uh, the, someone who, who doesn't pursue power. Uh, you know, Dr. Manmohan Singh, for example, uh, is, 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 is held up and, and revered so much more because he's perceived as someone who didn't pursue power and just came to him. Um, and, and, and I think that's got to do because of, of a popular perception that power corrupts, that power is dangerous and let us just sort of stay away from it and, and, and quietly serve and, 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 and let the universe deliver on it. So what are the risks that uh, the pursuit of power holds? See, I think, uh, I mean, I really think I'm more powerful today than <laughs> I was in the civil service. Huh? So it's not seeking power. It's You see, we so tend to uh, encapsulate power in position and authority. But power is in one's ideas and in one's character. And I think Gandhiji was a fantastic example of this in our country. We disagreed with him maybe then. I still may have disagreements with Gandhiji on many, many issues, but that doesn't take away from the stature of Gandhiji. And in him, we saw a blend of ethics, of the use of power, 
not for himself. So if you go away from power, I mean, uh, well, the only thing you can do is be a saint. You know, you can withdraw into spirituality. Mm -hmm. But if you live in the social universe and the socio-political universe, you and I, even if we don't want it, are endowed with power, being mm -hmm. born in a certain class, having gone to a certain kind of educational institution, mm -hmm. having access to certain things, we are powerful mm -hmm. without even mm -hmm. wanting it. Mm -hmm. How do we use the power mm -hmm. is, I think, the critical issue, and not craving for it at the cost of ethics, not craving for it at the cost of principles, not craving for it at all. But seeing it as a tool, I think, empowers everybody. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what we are fighting for is equal sharing of that power when no one is more than the other. Mm -hmm. And whoever comes to power is not beyond the rule of law mm -hmm. and questioning. Mm -hmm. It's something we have to carry along with us, along with this devolution of power. Mm -hmm. Then we see a new India. We see an ethical India, mm -hmm. which I think is the dream of most middle class people. Mm -hmm. They want to see mm -hmm. ethics in public life. And that is not possible without the sharing of power. You know, you talked about, uh, you mentioned a number of times of seeing a new India and, and, and sort of a commitment to, to India. Uh, th this is in a context when in, uh, the, the perception, at least, of, of national boundaries uh, is, is disappearing. And, and, and there is often the fear that it's because of the assertion of, of this kind of identity no matter how you, de you know, describe you know, India, is it sort of, sort of the Hindutva um, you know, notion of, uh, of, of India or is it the geographical boundaries uh, of India? Uh, I isn't it true that in many ways that it is this, this sort of hanging on to identities that has created uh, you know, the fragmented society that, uh, that we have and not m in addition to and alongside to you know, the, the issues of inequity that you talk about? You see, national boundaries do exist. I have to get a passport even to visit Sri Lanka, Pakistan, or Bangladesh. National governments exist. So there is one identity, which is that of a nation. A nation not defined by religion, not defined even by language in my country and yours. We have 17 languages. I'm Tamil speaking, married to a Bengali, and live in Rajasthan. I don't know what my language is and speak Hindi. So <laughs> you can't say that. But nevertheless, as a practical thing, there is the definition of a nation. But at another level, humankind is one, and we have no great differences. Genocide in India is no different from genocide in Africa or Eastern Europe. It's the same. So at that level, we are all the same. But it's the practicality of being able to deal with a situation and to be able to come overcome its constraints. We have to become small. We have to become nations. In fact, we have to become panchayats. We have to become municipalities to deal with it. Even the notion of a nation then disintegrates. I really think it is something like Newtonian and Einsteinian physics. Mm -hmm. Because Einstein discovered a different kind of physics, Newton, Newton did not become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So you need Newton and you need Einstein. So you need logic and you need a resolution of logic. Mm -hmm. So I think our relationship with national issues is relevant because we then shape a nation which is open to mm -hmm. the right kind of international relationships. And in this, I'd like to mention the example of the World Social Forum. Mm -hmm. All of us are believers mm -hmm. in, a world so in, the, in the World Social Forum, which says another world is possible. Mm -hmm. And another world how? Mm -hmm. Based on compassion, based on a positive relationship mm -hmm. of equality of trade practices, equality of political relationships of race, color, language, and religion. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's possible. You're watching a conversation with Aruna Roy. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Aruna Roy. Aruna, you've uh, been you know, talking about structures of uh, organizations and processes of decision making. Tell us about your own organization, yes. MKSS, yes. Uh, and, and, and how that is, that is, that is structured and, and what is the, the sort of mechanisms of decision making and, and in the interrelationships between all of you who work with and, and for the organization? Ours is a very, very small organization uh, called the Mazdoor Kisan Shakti Sangatan. It's now 14 years old. We began with a struggle against um, uh, on a land issue when land was held by a local landlord. And then we formed and we minimum wages and then right to information. We don't take any uh, national or international institutional funding. So we live mostly on uh, donations given by people who agree with our ideology and s sometimes agree to support a worker or something. And we also do other small things.
We decided not to take any funding, so we are a small group. We are about 10 to 12. That is what we call the uh, committee, the central committee, which comes and sits every month and decides. But it, that committee also is more than the paid workers. We are about 25 of us. And everybody has a vote, and I have one vote. And my decision is not, my opinion sometimes does not carry through. We are all very critical of each other, and we all have to approve of something before it's done. And in large campaigns, for instance, we have to get the mandate of hundreds of people. So we have to go into the villages and we have to get their mandate before we can put anything into action. The internal democracy has worked so far. Even to come here, I've had to get them to say, yes, you can go to this interview. Mm -hmm. So I can't say yes unless I consult with them. Once I consult with them, then yes. And we also have very strict norms about our personal behavior, what we can keep and not keep, what we can do or not do. And we live. What are some of the examples of this? Well, for one thing, we have uh, extremely strict norms about amount of money we will earn. We earn the minimum wage as salary. Anything we get beyond that goes back into the Sangatan. Uh, I mean, if I come, I get an honor area or somebody else gets an honor If I'm not being too inquisitive, what is that minimum wage? Now in Rajasthan, it's 73 rupees a day as of the, I think, the 20th of August. Before that, it was 60 rupees a day. When we went to uh, Devdungri, it was 11 rupees a day. <laughs> so, it forces us to live very much like the people we live with. We never do really because we have access to things. Some of us who come from outside have access to things. The people who are local people, well, uh, they have to live within that amount and we also try and live within that amount. So we work and in this we are very Gandhian. We all do our own work. We cook together and we clean together and the living is as important as the work. So when I'm in Dev Dungri, first few hours of my morning will go in cooking and cleaning and f feeding ourselves and then we begin the day. It's also to get ourselves into the rhythm of the people we work with. See what happens when you have the notion of a canteen or a mess or somebody else cooking for you is that you forget that the rhythm of other people is different especially of women. So for me it's very important to know that she only gets free at 10 o'clock. She has to get through all the chores. So we carry water, men carry water on their heads which is a big thing in Rajasthani villages and so on. So we feel that our lifestyle cannot be too contradictory to what we say. It still is. We do have a telephone in that mud house. We do have you know, access to some <laughs> electronic stuff in that house. But still, as far as possible. So we try, so what they say in Hindi, sadgi, simplicity, we think is a virtue. Because also in a political battle, you know, the less you have, the less anyone can take away from you. And this is also a Gandhian norm. But aren't you sort of implicitly, uh, you know, uh, the leader of the group is in the sense that you know Gandhi was for for the community that he was working with. They, you know, they, they looked up to him. They, they look up to you. You provide uh, leadership. You provide erudition. You provide a certain vocabulary. Is that necessarily <laughs> a bad thing? I think it may be in the Indian context not a very good thing. And I'm not the leader. It, you know, Shankar was my colleague in work. We began together. Shankar Nikhil and I went together. Someone asked Shankar uh, in an interview, Aruna has got the magsese. So how has it changed her position in the villages? He said, you know, they don't know the meaning of magsese. They don't know where it comes from. It makes no difference to them. If she performs, she's acceptable. If she refuses to perform or doesn't perform, she's out. So, so far as we are concerned, it's how she performs that's important, whether she you know, acts as she states. If she doesn't, she's out. So actually in my group, I'm not the leader. They don't see me as the leader. They see me as having a function which is very important. Like for instance, if, I have to, if we have to communicate with the rural people, then I'm not as important as Shankar or Lal Singh Ji. They're fantastic. I mean, I can do a job, but I'm not as good as they are. When it comes to legal drafting or legal documents, then Nikhil is absolutely fabulous. We can't replace him. And when it comes to theater, it's Shankar again because he's so phenomenally good. When it comes to ethical issues, there's no one like Lal Singh Ji. We all, he's our touchstone for ethics. And what's your sort of My strength? role is uh, the middle class <laughs> rubber stamp I have on my face <laughs> that I'm the leader. <laughs> so somewhere I have to also deal with that uh, notion of my being a leader. It's very difficult for me because I really live in, uh, in a fragmented universe. In one universe, I'm one of many, which is wonderful. And I come out of that universe and I'm seen as the representative of that group. But somehow we've been battling it. Even with the getting of the Maxis, we tried to get it for the organization. So 
So everywhere I go, I talk about it. And really, I and that humility is very important for real democracy to come through. If you look at, for instance, Norway or Sweden or any one of the very evolved democracies, even the king goes to cycle, goes on cycle to buy his food and his vegetables. Why not? And nobody gets off the car or gets off a cycle to salute him. He just goes by doing his job. So egalitarianism, if we really want full, you know, finally we want complete equality, we'll have to somewhere look at this role of leadership. And I don't accept it even within movements. Uh, it's not only uh, a disease of uh, politics and rulers. It's a disease all over the country. And the moment you appoint somebody as a leader, you abrogate and completely absolve yourself of all responsibility to do anything. You place it on that leader. That leader then becomes larger than life. Expectations are phenomenal. Then they get clay feet. You dump them. And then you start looking for another leader. <laughs> and that saga never ends. So I think both for self-protection and preservation, as well as looking at myself and everybody else as just human beings, I think it's very important. And the right to information was not my idea. It was the idea of illiterate members of my group who really said, if those documents don't come out, we'll be forever liars that led us to see the importance of these documents. So I don't think in, in my milieu, I might provide the idiom. But this idiom derives from a very rich local perception and knowledge, which is uh, in many places, not only the MKSs, it's all over. We just have to listen to hear absolute wisdom and uh, understanding everywhere. Anur Roy, thank you very much. You are an inspiration. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Rajiv.